Hey everybody, welcome back to Heart Breathing. So today is part four of our Writing Great Scenes series. And this is really where everything we've talked about so far with your character's goal and conflict and desire, it's all gonna come together today. And we're gonna talk about how you structure your scenes and how they're put together, which is really gonna help you figure out what happens in your novel. So I'm really excited to talk about this. Let's get started. So earlier in the series, I mentioned that scenes are really like micro stories in your book. They're mini stories. And so in the same way that your reader progresses from scene to scene to scene, your character is progressing on this journey that they have to go from who they are and whatever their situation is at the beginning of the story to who they need to become by the end of it in order to win the story or to end the story in some way. In many ways, scenes are going to mirror the overarching story. So your character usually has some kind of goal that carries throughout the entire storyline, right? So this is their big goal to save the person, to prove their innocence. You know, there's some overarching goal, but that goal plays out inside scenes step by step by step. So when you think about the structure of your scene, it's often helpful to be thinking about the fact that this scene is one step on the pathway. And in terms of my character's overall goal, the overall conflict of the story, this scene needs to have one small piece of it. So you're putting together this large puzzle and each scene is a tiny piece of that conflict or a stepping stone to what needs to happen next in the story. And that can often be helpful helpful when it comes to deciding what happens in the story and figuring out how to structure it. And also in the same way with a larger novel that you have learned about a beginning, a middle and an end, we're going to discuss the beginning, middle and end of scene structure. So hopefully this is really going to help you if you have struggled with this in the past. So let's start with the beginning of a scene. Similar to how your entire novel often will start with some kind of hook that re brings the reader in, Every scene in your story can also have a hook. So it's some kind of opening sentence or paragraph that really grounds your reader into the who, what, where type scenario that you're dealing with in the story. So who's talking? What are they dealing with? What's their goal? So remember in video two, we talked a lot about your character's goal or desire. The beginning of your scene is often where you really let your reader know, this is what my character's after. And it doesn't have to be a statement of, this is what I want in this scene. It can be implied. It can be pretty obvious. When your character walks into the office, you know because of what's happened just before that they're looking for some kind of clue. And that is the goal of the scene. So often it's implied or it's inherent based on what's happened before, what this goal is. But it's important in most scenes, unless you're doing something to specifically keep it a secret from your reader because of the type of story you're telling to let the reader know what is my character's goal in this scene. So hook them in, get them interested. And of course, there are lots of different ways to hook your reader. This can be starting with action right from the first sentence. This could be an interesting piece of dialogue. It could be your character's fear that they're going to get caught. And so it's that internal monologue. What if I get caught? That's an interesting hook into a scene because now you're already drawn into that conflict right from the start. So you have lots of tools as to how you can hook people in, but the key in the beginning of a scene is to really ground the reader in what's going on, who's talking, and what's my character trying to accomplish in this scene. Another part of the hook and the goal, of course, is also does your reader understand what's at stake? So if you start out with what if I get caught, hopefully because of what's come before, the reader will understand what's at stake. But sometimes in this beginning part, you might want to have a moment of dialogue or inner monologue where your reader reminds us like, if I fail at this thing, or if I don't get this information, or if I don't escape, here's what's going to happen to me. So your reader should be aware of what's at stake if your character fails. And all of that happens usually towards the beginning of your scene. So now we move into the middle of your scene. This is the meat of the scene. This is the longest part of a scene, just like the middle of your novel is the longest part of your novel. And this part of your scene is usually focused on the conflict. So this is, of course, everything we talked about in video three. So if you haven't watched those earlier sessions or parts of this series, I highly recommend 
recommend that you head back to watch those. I'll put that playlist down below for you. So remember that conflict is basically the obstacle to your character's goal. And that's going to be the main like middle part. Now, in some scenes, this conflict is going to be an actual battle. Like it could be a struggle. You walk into the, your character walks into an office trying to figure out some kind of secret information. They're scared they're going to get caught. So we know their goal. We know what's at stake for them if they get caught. And then in the middle of the scene, someone does actually walk in and catch them. And there's an actual struggle. Maybe there's a gun in the desk drawer and the gun goes off. So it can be an actual struggle of what happens. It also could be something much more subtle, depending on what you need this scene to be in terms of the stepping stones of your story. Because whatever that conflict is that stands in their way in this scene, it is going to have some kind of ripple effect. There's always a cause and effect. So whatever happens in this scene in terms of the conflict and the ending, which we'll talk about in a second, it's going to lead us into what happens next, just like you're taking steps down a path. So the middle of the scene is what's standing in your character's way. So then when we get to the end of a scene, what we're mostly looking at is what's the outcome of this conflict? The gun went off what happened? Does your character get away? Are they captured? Are they injured? What is the outcome? Now, K.M. Wyland in her book called Structuring Your Novel, which I highly, highly recommend and have left a link for you down below, she calls this the disaster. And of course, not every single scene is going to end in complete disaster. But if you want to keep creating obstacles for your character and you want to make the story interesting, you do need to have things not work out the way that your character planned for them to work out. And sometimes it can even work out, but that working out has now caused them a new problem, right? So what is the outcome of your scene? And again, this can happen and be something very subtle, or it can be something huge, like your character shot, and now they're blacking out, and we're going to see them again next time when they wake up in a hospital or in some kind of dungeon or prison cell or whatever it is. So whatever this outcome of your scene is the outcome of the obstacle. So you have the beginning, which is the hook. You let your reader know what your character's goal is. Then you have the middle, which is where we develop the conflict. Whatever obstacle is standing in your character's way appears and they deal with it, they interact with it. And then the outcome is the ending of your scene, which is basically how did that conflict get resolved in this moment? And then of course, whatever that outcome is, is going to lead to the next scene in your story. The way I think about endings too, is that in some way your character needs to be left off balance or they need to be left with some kind of feeling of what am I going to do next? This didn't go the way I wanted. I need a new plan or this wasn't how I planned for things to be. And now I have to change who I am in some way. So it leaves your character off balance. It creates some kind of change either in who your character is or what their plan was or what their goals were to begin with. And that change is what leads us into them making a different decision in the next scene. So I also wanted to talk about the symbol crash when it comes to the ending of a scene. I cannot remember where I first heard this particular term, but I think that it was from Libby Hawker's book, Take Off Your Pants, which is a book about uh, pantsers who want to learn how to plot a little bit better. So I will leave a link for that book down below. But I think I also have heard James Scott Bell kind of talk about this idea of a symbol crash. And I always think about this when I'm writing chapters in particular, but also scenes that it can really keep your reader turning pages. In fact, it's one of the greatest tools that you have in your writer's toolbox to keep readers staying up all night, continue to turn pages, be super engaged in the story is at the end of your scene you have some kind of symbol crash. So the reader's following you along and then there's a, a single sentence or phrase or something that happens at the end of that scene that really hits you in the gut, that has a moment of resonance or something extra to it that makes your reader go, what? Oh my gosh, now I have to know exactly what happens next. And you can do this in all kinds of genre and that symbol crash or that resonant moment will often pair up with the way that you want your reader to feel. So if you're writing something that's a suspense genre, you want those symbol crash moments to feel suspenseful. If you're writing a romance, then you want those symbol crash moments to tie into the 
angst or the feeling of romance or that feeling of love or loss or aching or longing for someone, that should be the symbol crash of every single scene. And when you can really get good at those symbol crash moments at the end, that single sentence at the end that just makes it all resonate or makes your reader long for that next scene, the better of a writer you're going to be. And I promise you, the more books you will sell. My readers in particular love to call this my dun 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 moment because that is the type of genre that I write. I write young adult, mostly young adult fantasy or contemporary fantasy, and they all have mysteries and suspense and twists and turns. And so at the end of every chapter or the end of every scene, there's that last little dun 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 moment. And in fact, when I'm doing live readings and things with my fans, they will all in the chat, you can see them talking to each other about, oh, that was a dun 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 moment. And they know that's going to be the end of the reading for the day because it leaves you wanting more. And the more you can do that for your readers is the more you can build excitement, really entertain them. And so I highly recommend mastering the dun 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 symbol crash kind of moment. So now that we've gone over the idea of the beginning, middle, end, and the little extra dun dun dun, I thought that I would share with you an example from my book, The Witch's Key. So in this book, you have a teenage heroine named Lenora that we call Lenny, who has recently lost her parents to a demon. So they're demon hunting family. She's grown up in this magical family her whole life. And now that her parents are gone, she's had to come and live with her uncle Martin. He's this strange, mysterious older man that she doesn't know anything about. And she spent the summer basically being a recluse and a hermit. And now towards the beginning of the book, she is having to go to high school for the first time. And her goal in the scene becomes obvious right from the start. So from these first couple sentences, she says, 20 minutes later, as I stood in front of the doors to Newcastle High, I felt nearly invisible, just like I wanted. So Lenny's goal, to be invisible and not stand out on her first day of school. The stakes for her, we understand because of what's come before. The stakes at this point are completely emotional for her. In the first few chapters, we learn just how hard of a time Lenny has had it since her parents' death and how much she's hoping to just blend in. She's never been to a normal school before. She doesn't want to dry, you know, grab any attention. She just wants to blend in and survive. And so she doesn't want to deal with any of the type of magical things or magical creatures that got her parents killed. She just wants to be like normal and invisible. So as we move into the middle or action of the scene, the conflict starts to appear. Everyone who walked up smiled and greeted friends they'd probably had since preschool, but no one seemed to notice me at all. My spell had worked. I'd used just enough amaranth to help me blend in, but not enough to make me completely invisible. Hopefully this would make high school a lot more tolerable. I would show up, do whatever I needed to do to survive it, keep my head down, and that would be that. It was just one year, after all. I took a deep breath and told my feet to start walking, but I couldn't seem to force them forward. Literally every single muscle in my body was rebelling against the idea of high school. It's not as bad as it looks, a bubbly voice said out of nowhere. At first, I assumed she was talking to someone else, but then this small, energetic girl was suddenly there smiling up at me like we were old friends. Okay, so here's where the conflict starts. Her spell worked, so we know she's a witch. That was stuff that came before that now leads into this scene. But this girl notices her right away. Did she see through the magic? And if so, does that mean that she's some kind of paranormal being? And that is just going to ruin Lenny's day because she doesn't want any paranormal anything here. So as the scene progresses, the conflict increases and we learn a piece of information that hints at the larger conflict of the entire novel. So this becomes a stepping stone here. We all have to stick together right now with everything that's going on, she said, her eyes looking downward. What's going on? I asked. It's just terrible, isn't it? She asked, all the joy drained from her voice. I can't even bring myself to talk about those girls. Nothing like that has ever happened in Newcastle before. No one really knows how to deal with it. So Lenny learns here that not only is she not invisible like she hoped, there's potentially magical people here in Newcastle and there are girls who are missing 
and probably dead, potentially dead. So this is the kind of mystery her parents used to look into all the time. So now it's worst case scenario for her. She comes to this high school hoping that she's gonna be invisible and what happens? Not only is there some girl here that she can't quite figure out that sees through her invisibility kind of glamor, but also she learns that there are mysteriously these girls missing and she's probably gonna be pulled into the same kind of mystery that her parents got killed trying to look after. So this is no good. She wants no part of it. So then as that scene progresses between her and this new girl, Peyton, this is what leads us into the end of the scene where she realizes that her dream or desire or goal of just blending in and avoiding any kind of magical life in this town is completely hopeless. I started to put in my combination, but before I was finished, a chill ran down my back that was so strong, my entire body shivered. I stopped breathing for a moment, my hand stopping completely as I focused on that feeling. It was the last thing I had expected to feel here today in a town like this. Martin had said everyone in this town was human, normal. Mostly, he'd said. They were mostly human. Do you need help? Peyton asked. Here, I can show you how to do it. I remember the first time I... I tuned her voice out for a moment and slowly turned around, searching every single face in the hallway. My heart raced, and I hardly allowed myself to take a breath as I scanned the room. That feeling had come from someone here, someone close. And then suddenly, there he was. He was tall, over six feet if I had to guess. His dark hair was just long enough to fall across his forehead, but not so long that it covered his dark, serious eyes. His tanned skin practically glowed with the health of immortality, even under these crappy fluorescent lights. He was strong, too, judging by the muscles that strained against the sleeves of his gray t-shirt. But most importantly, there was a certain energy about him that I'd come to recognize over the years as other. This guy, whoever he was, was not human. And he was staring straight at me. Do you hear that symbol crash moment at the end of that scene? I could have just ended it with her saying, this guy, whoever he was, was not human. And that would have been a good outcome, disaster for her. Oh my gosh, there's a guy here. He's, you know, he's obviously not human. All my plans and goals are out the door. But intuitively, I knew I wanted to add that symbol crash zinger at the moment. And he was staring straight at me. That, boom, hits you a little bit harder in the heart. It makes you go, oh my gosh, not only is he not human, but he knows that she is something other too, which makes things even worse for Liddy because there's no way she's gonna avoid being dragged into all of this if he knows who she is. Definitely a disastrous outcome for a girl whose goal was just simply to be invisible and to get through the school year. So on day one, goal destroyed. And of course, then the thing is, what's next? So you've got your beginning, your middle, your end, your symbol crash or zinger at the end of that scene. And then the reader turns the page and what happens next. So we're going to talk about this for a minute. When we get to the end of a scene, there's often another piece to it that is a moment of resonance, a moment of reflection, a moment of recalibration. And this is what Jack Bickham in his book, Scene and Structure, calls a sequel. So scene and sequel. This is something that K.M. Wyland also talks about in Structuring Your Novel. So again, those two books would be at the top of my list to definitely pick up. So a sequel is kind of a beat after the main action of a scene where your character has sometimes a moment of introspection or a moment of, oh my gosh, where they're processing what just happened in the main scene. So if you've got some kind of big conflict, it can often be really nice to have that emotional internal beat for your character and for your reader in terms of pacing where your character processes what's just happened kind of tries to figure out where that leaves them now and what are they going to do next and so when it comes to beginning middle and end this is kind of like a reaction scene a recalibration an emotional beat a moment in between scenes where your character takes a second to figure out what they're going to do next and this sometimes can be just literally just a sentence or two or sometimes it can be an entire chapter or scene so i find that I don't always have a sequel. And 
this is something I've been really kind of thinking about in my own writing. Now, in a book like The Witch's Key, where I have a single point of view, I have more sequel type moments because we're in Lenny's point of view the entire book. And so for pacing, we need some of those moments of reflection and recalibration more so than other types of multi POV books. With my Shadow Demon Saga later books and my Eternal Sorrow series, I have five or more points of view characters in that book. And so often I find that I will leave one character with a dun 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 kind of moment and then I'll move to a calmer moment for another character. And that kind of works as a sequel, even though it's not happening with the same characters. This is something with POV. I would love if you guys would be interested in hearing or getting another series of videos about writing multiple POV. I would love to talk about the way that sometimes a scene for me is split in half um, and how I tend to structure that. And most of that for me has been intuitive. So it would be kind of interesting to pull that apart and talk about it more. But I will say that in terms of pacing and figuring out what happens next, it can be really exhausting for a reader to just get nothing but action and conflict action and conflict, action and conflict. They need a moment and your character needs a moment for their own development. If your character never takes a step back and says, whoa, that wasn't at all what I thought it was going to be. What am I going to do next? Who do I need to become? We're sometimes going to miss out on a lot of that character's development in terms of their internal journey. Plus, sometimes in order for that next big step to be taken and us to understand why they're taking that step. We need just that small beat of your character processing what just happened and then deciding that they're going to go do this other thing because of it. And so it's sort of a bridge. The sequel can be a bridge between action scenes or deciding what your next goal is as a character. So now that you're aware that this scene and sequel thing can happen, you have a beginning, middle and end of a scene, and then you have the sequel moment, which I'll talk about individual structure for that in just a second. I encourage you to start watching TV series, reading books, thinking of it in terms of the scene and sequel when you watch movies and things, because it can be the kind of moment where it's like the villain just came in and threatened your character who's chained up. And when he leaves, your character has this moment of, wow, that was a new clue. How can I use this to get free? Or it's the kind of moment where your character has this run in with a guy in the hallway at teen, you know, teen high school or whatever, and they rush into the bathroom to splash their face with water and they sit and think about what just happened to them and how they're reacting. Maybe their hands are shaking and they're having some kind of reaction to it. That is a sequel and it is a type of scene in a way, but it's really kind of a bridge between scenes. And the more you start to see it, the more you understand how they function in story stories. It's also really fun to see how really good writers keep the tension up during these kind of emotional sequel beats. Because what I have found in my observations is that a lot of times writers will make it a very internal type of thing that they'll really hone in on your character's fear or worry or their understanding that they need to change, but knowing that they're having a hard time with it, that's often where the tension comes in or the dread of, oh my gosh, my character has no idea how to deal with this conflict and they're about to make another decision that is just going to be terrible. And that tension starts to ratchet up as your character goes to take that next step. So that's kind of fun to pay attention to as well. So I'm not going to go into this more too much more today, but I did want to mention it also wanted to mention that in terms of the structure of a sequel, you can get more information from those two books that I mentioned. But when you talk about the beginning, middle and end of a scene, you're often talking about goal conflict outcome or goal conflict disaster. So then the structure she says of a sequel is often reaction, dilemma, decision, meaning your character reacts to whatever just happened, they process whatever the new dilemma is because of the conflict, and then they make a decision about what to do next. So again, highly recommend picking up Structure Your Novel Has Changed My Life, Scene and Structure by Jack Bickham. Go grab those books. Okay, now that you understand the structure of a scene, it should be able to help you, I hope, put together your scene cards. So over in your workbook that I made for you guys on writing great scenes that again, you can grab when you sign up for my newsletter list, I will leave a link for you down below. Um, there is an example of a scene card. So on this scene card, I kind of share with you what I typically will put on my index cards when I'm plotting out what happens next to my story. So I'll do a scene overview, which can be a brief description of the action of the scene 
scene. So for that scene in The Witch's Key, I would write as, as an overview, like Lenny arrives to her first day of school after casting a mild invisibility spell. So next, I'm going to list my POV character, what their goal is, and what's at stake for them. Now, if you only have one point of view character in the whole novel, you don't need to put it because you know whose character is talking. But if you have like romance where you're writing dual POV or you have multiple point of view characters, it's good to put that on the scene card so you know whose eyes you're telling the story through. So in my example from The Witch's Key, I would write something here like, Lenny's goal is to blend in and not stand out on her first day of school. And the stakes are that in emotional stakes where she'll be pulled in. So I would physically write, Lenny hopes no one will notice her and she won't have to deal with any magic or danger like she did when she was living with her parents. So that ties into her emotional stakes, right? This simple sentence tells me how this scene is building on the previous scene and it's telling me what her goals are and why it's so important to her that she blends in. Then underneath that, I will often list the conflict of the scene. So in this particular example, I would have put Peyton notices Lenny anyway and won't stop talking to her, which leads to her dropping some information about the mysterious disappearance of some local girls. This makes Lenny scared because she's becoming aware that there might be more to this town than she originally thought. So that gives me a pretty good idea of what the conflict is, the meat of what's going to be happening in the scene. She's going to be talking to Peyton in the course of conversation. She's going to find out about these missing girls. Then at the bottom of the scene card, I just like to state the outcome. So of course, this is, as K.M. Wyland calls it, the disaster. Um, for this scene, I would have written, just as she's beginning to realize she won't be free of her old dangerous life, she senses someone's magic nearby. When she turns, she sees him, tall, dark, mysterious, and he definitely sees her too. So this, I might put a little bit more short form. When I put it actually on my plotting chart inside my happy planner notebook, if you've never seen that before, or when I put it on my plotting wall, if you've never seen that before, I will put some plotting videos down below. I'm super visual. So sometimes when I'm plotting, I will write these up on the board. I'll put them in my planner and I will have them more long form on my post-it notes. On a post-it note here, I probably would just say, Lenny shows up at her first day of school. Peyton tells her about the missing girls. That would probably be the main things that I would put. Maybe I would also say at the end, Kai sees her and I would write it as short form as I can on a little sticky note. When I'm putting it on a page flag in my actual planner, it's so tiny. It would just say Lenny's first day of school. And I would know from my other notes what happens during that. So if you guys want a more detailed video in the future as to how I actually fill out those plotting walls, the plotting chart in the planner and my index card and how they differ from each other and why I do all three of those, which again, none of this stuff is necessary. This is just my process and I share it not to tell you that I think you should do it this way, but just because it's helped worked for me. So you never know what might click for you as well. But if you can clearly write out what is your character's goal, what's the obstacle standing in their way, and what is the disaster or outcome to that obstacle that's going to lead them into something new or is going to present a problem for them that they're going to have to make a new decision or a new plan, you basically have an entire outline of your scene. So I hope this has been super helpful for you. I know this was a nice, long, beefy video, but I hope that it was fun for you to kind of hear that example and hear me walk through it. I think it would also be fun in the future to maybe fill out those scene cards and share with you like multiple scene cards. But definitely in part five, we're going to talk about how one scene leads into the, into the next and how you pair those and continue stacking them together to create really good pacing in your story in terms of each individual scene playing into the next one. So I hope that you will join me for that fifth series video coming out next week. If you have not subscribed to this channel, I would love for you to subscribe now, sign up for my newsletter list down below, and I will send you not only a entire workbook that goes along with writing great scenes, but a workbook on how to plot your novel, how to edit your novel, how to track your uh, word counts and other things like that. So I love my newsletter hearties and I would love for you to be one of them. And please go ahead, hit the like on this video, share it with your friends and comment down below. And I will see you guys in my next one. Bye. Mm -hmm.